It's Mission Month, Church. It's Mission Month. April is the month of missions, and we are looking into the importance, significance, as well as the application of the Great Commission of our Lord unto us. And this month, specifically, we will be, what you call, focusing on this aspect of the call of God upon each and every one of us to be His witnesses empowered by His Spirit. On the 20th and 21st would be our Mission Weekend, and Mission Weekend on the 21st is also known in Gateway as All Nations Sunday. All Nations Sunday means you come dressed in your traditional attire. So don't forget on the 21st of April is our All Nations Sunday. Come dressed in your own uh, cultural attire and we will give thanks unto the Lord. So what is the Vision Month uh, focusing this year? The Mission Committee, the Mission Committee uh, gathered together and then they discuss and as we look to the Lord, we are focusing on this particular theme, yeah? the divine commission in partnership with God. God has given us His divine commission, the great commission, and we are called to be partners with Him. We are called to be partners with Him. And so we are looking at this aspect, this particular month, and also this year, and how we can partner with God in all the various things that He's doing through us here in Gateway Christian Fellowship, yeah? And the verse comes from Mark 16, 20. And they went out and preached everywhere and the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. God is working with us. He's, we are, as the Apostle Paul said in Corinthians 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, sorry, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1, we are co-laborers together with Him. We are partners together with God in this mission field. And so every one of us are partners with God, and this mission month, we endeavor to remind and also to instill and inculcate in us that understanding that we are partners together with Him. Mark 16, 20 says it very clearly. And what are the activities um, that we're going to have? We're going to start with a prayer partnership, and that will be on the 13th of April. That is this coming Saturday at 6.30 in the morning, if you can wake up. You can come and join us. Huh? We'll let you know the details of the place where we are gathering and all that via Gateway Info, Gateway Ladies and Gateway Men as well. All right, so you can come and join us at 6.30 and we are specifically praying for um, many, many, what you call uh, mission-related matters connected to our country, our state, and as well as the region that we are in. And second, after that, we'll have our breakfast together. All right? So if you want to come just for the breakfast, also fine. La. <laughs> okay, fine. All right. And uh, secondly, we're going to have a mission outreach partnership, and uh, that will be on the 20th of April. Uh, the different groups in the church will be, what do you call, uh, attending to this part of uh, our endeavor. WHOM, for the mission committee, said this year we will try to look into or focus or remind the people of God the importance of widows, homeless, orphans, and migrants. Now, in the Bible, many of the times in the Old Testament, God judges His people because of this reason. See, you despise the widows, you didn't attend to the fatherless, you, the strangers among you, which are the migrants, huh? the strangers among you mistreat them, you don't, I'm going to judge you, He said. You read the Old Testament, it's all there. God is very upset with His people sometimes because of those reasons. And James says, true religion is visiting Widows and the fatherless. Remember that? Do you know that that is the only place in the Bible the word religion appears in the New Testament? The Bible does not subscribe to religion, but the word religion is the only place it appears in 1 James. True religion is that. That means God has His... God is the, is the father of the fatherless. He is the protector of widows. Demo? Husband of widows. Demo? He is the protector of the strangers. So this year we're going to focus on that here and also all the works that we are doing in this country as well as out in this region. Yeah? And then you will be given mission partnership updates, all the money that you've been giving and church, where is it going and then who is benefiting from it, what is the work being done and so on. You'll be updated throughout this month. Yeah? And also we'll have mission partnership training which will stretch out throughout this whole year. All right, so this is just for information. Be on the lookout on Gateway Info. Be also on the lookout on your respective uh, groups, for example, young adults, uh, the seniors, SOL, and so on. Yeah? All right, so thank you for your partnership. 
All right. Are you, are you excited to look forward to the, what you call the, the month, of, what you call the, the weeks ahead? Because we're going to discover together how we can partner with Him. Amen. Can we commit this month unto the Lord and ask Him to be the Lord who will be guiding us, the Lord of the harvest, eh? who will be guiding us? Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity as a church that we can partner together with you and remind ourselves, Lord, that we are partners together with you in your field, in the great commission that you have given to us. You are working with us, O God. And Lord, we ask of you that you will grant us your wisdom. You are the Lord of the harvest. You know the harvest, Lord, and you have called us to accomplish all that your Son has done for us on the cross, Lord. And so we thank you for sending us out as your witnesses, Lord, here in Malacca and wherever, Lord, that we are, or in the communities even, that we have been stationed, Lord. And so we thank you, we bless you, guide us, lead us, grant us the wisdom, take the will of our minds, and help us, Lord, to comprehend your purpose and your plans in our lives, O oh God. In Jesus, our Lord, most precious name. Amen. All right, this morning... Chapter 9. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part the high priest went alone, once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins, committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. The title of my sharing this morning is What Transpired in Heaven. We are still in the season, with the church terms as the Easter tide. That means we are still remembering the Lord's death, resurrection, ascension, and even the sending forth of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. What really transpired in heaven during this time? What really transpired in heaven while all those things were going on on earth? The suffering of the Lord, the crucifixion of the Lord, and as well as His burial and resurrection. What was really going on in heaven at this time? It is a big subject, it is a difficult subject, because I have never been to heaven. But the only place I'll know to find it is in the Scripture, and the Scripture is very clear about what really transpired in heaven at that time. Because what transpired in heaven has got a lot of application to our daily life here. Because our prayer, or the Lord's prayer, we call it or we term it, is as it is in heaven, so here on earth. Your, will, your name be hallowed, your will be done, your kingdom come. All in this context, as it is in heaven, so here on earth. But this morning, like uh, Spurgeon said, yeah? Spurgeon said, in thinking upon this subject, what subject is this? About the life, death, resurrection of Christ. I seem to hear a voice saying to me, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. This is what the angel of the Lord told Moses, take off your shoe, because this is a holy ground. And Spurgeon said, this is the central mystery of our religion, of our faith. It becomes us to be reverent in heart as we approach it. The doctrine of substitu substitution eh, is the heart of the whole matter. The, our whole heart needs to be aroused 
while we speak upon it. This morning, with fear and trembling, I'm going to speak the Word of the Lord on this subject, and I, I'm positioning myself in such a way that, that I'm taking off all the shoes around me, and I'm just going to, what do you call, uh, focus on what exactly the Lord wants to speak and speak to your heart and set you free from all the lies and deception that has surrounded us. So, one of the mystery or the mystery of mysteries in the Scripture which baffled the prophets as well is this. The sacrifice and the sacrificer is the same person. When the prophets prophesied, they could never distinguish it. They have always wondered, who is this? What is this? Who's going to get it done? How is going to get it done? It looks almost impossible. But what God had in His eternal plan was that the sacrifice and the sacrificer is the same person. The Lamb of God is also the high priest. And this is the wonder of wonder of the plan of God, how He does it. The, the Lamb of God is also the high priest. While He is the Lamb of God on the cross, He's the high priest in heaven. He's just, he's just baffling how it works. Eh? And uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 9 says it very clearly that He offered Himself without spot to God through the eternal spirit. All the Trinity members are there. God the Father, He offered Himself without spot to God. He, Christ, offered Himself without spot to God through the eternal spirit. So the whole atonement process for our sins was done by the Trinity and it involves heaven and earth. It involves heaven and earth. And it's so awesome that it blows us out of our mind how God did it. Because He loves us so much, church. If there's anything that you can take away from today's sharing, is that God loves us so much that it's difficult for us to understand it. Like the hymn said just now, no? He did not spare His own Son, but He gave Him up for us all. Romans 8. And, and how could we share His reward? On what basis? I cannot. We don't have an answer, the hymn writer said. How can we share on His reward? Because He became the Lamb and the High Priest. The closest we have in terms of the person who is sacrificing and offering the sacrifice is Solomon in the dedication of the first temple. During the dedication of the first temple, Solomon did a prophetic thing. He went, because they had a very huge burnt offering altar, he went up onto the altar, stood on the altar, and he offered a prayer to God. It was almost a prophetic thing of what the Son of God will do, the greater Solomon. And he stood there and he said, and he prayed the prayer before God. None of the kings have ever done it, neither the priests. But Solomon did it prophetically to say what the Son of God will be doing, the one who is called greater than Solomon. And, and because he is the sacrifice and the sacrificer, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 to 28, but I'm just highlighting the important part here. And it says this, For Christ has, has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now church, when we read our Bible, we tend to read it and see that, so what, Christ returned to heaven. Do you know that the whole of heaven now, first time they are seeing the Son of God in flesh, the only part of earth that is in heaven now is the flesh. When Christ entered into heaven, He is entering into heaven with His flesh, with the nail-scarred wounds. And when He's entering, can you imagine all the angelic beings, all the cherubims and the seraphims, they were all looking at the Son of God who left, them, left the throne to be Son of Man and now returning. And they were all looking at Him and He's coming as the high priest entering into the very presence of God for the first time with His resurrected body. And what the Bible says is entering into the presence of God for you and I, church, that now to appear in the presence of God for us at the end of the ages, He has appeared to put away by the sacrifice of Himself. Appeared as what? Appeared as a high priest. To put away our sin, by being the Lamb of God. By being the Lamb of God. You know, when 
He said the last word on the cross. Matthew says it as he gave up his spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Then the veil in the physical temple in Jerusalem was torn into two from top to bottom. Top to bottom means uh, to bottom mean God is the one who did it, right? When that was torn, and he has already said according to the Gospel of John, it is finished, it is accomplished. What happened in heaven happened on earth. Always remember, as it is in heaven, so here on earth. The veil was torn into two. According to Matthew 27, verse 50 to 51, it goes like this. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And John says the loud voice means it is finished. It has been accomplished. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Something happened in heaven. And what happened in heaven? Because as the high priest, all that was prophesied, all the types that was already in the first five books of the Bible are now being fulfilled in heaven itself, specifically the role of the high priest or the role of the Aaronic and the Levitical priesthood. Eh? You know, church, if you want to see or understand the whole of the story of incarnation, the death, the burial, resurrection, the second coming of Christ, read the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews, whether you realize it or not, it covers everything from page to page with us in it. And the whole context is, he is the great high priest. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1. Now this is the sum of all that I want to say. We have such a great high priest who is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And because of that, here it goes. The writer to the Hebrew said, this is where we are in our position of faith. This is where we are in our access to God. And this is our true salvation in Christ. So, the book of Hebrews somehow touches on aspects that we do not know. Do you know that the book of Hebrews touches also on the Garden of Gethsemane? It is said that he cried in the days of, while he was on earth, he cried loud prayers unto the Lord. And we knew, we know for a surety where, it's the, where it was. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane that he cried. My, there's one verse in, in the book of Hebrews that always shakes me. Whenever I'm suffering, I always go back to that verse. It's found in chapter 5. It goes like this. If the Son of God learned obedience through the things he suffered, how much more you and I? I'm adding the last part. The Son of God learned obedience through the things which He suffered. If the Son of, I always ask the question, if the Son of God learned obedience through the things He suffered, how much more me? He, he learned obedience through the things He suffered. And how much more you and I? We have to understand that part because He left us an example. So the book of Hebrews covers all these things and then it tells you about the first and second coming of Christ. It also tells you about the heavenly temple. Okay. When God spoke to Moses on the mountain, He showed him heaven actually. And He told Moses, according to the pattern I have shown you, you follow. So He built the tabernacle, which was the tent then. And through the uh, tabernacle, He communicated to the people of God what is actually happening in heaven. The only thing is, there was no high priest in heaven yet. Because the order of Aaron, or the Aaronic order of high priests and the Levitical priesthood, those helpers and so on, is only effective on earth. In heaven, there's another order. It's called, according to the writer, the book of Hebrews, the order of Melchizedek. The order of Melchizedek will be the Son of God Himself, and under that order is you and I, all the priests, the royal priesthood. Okay? So the temple of heaven is just there before the... A lot of people ask, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Where is the Ark of the Covenant? You read the book of Revelation, it says, and then the temple door was open, and then there was great light, and there was the Ark of the Covenant. Right there. We do not know what it is. We, it, it, our minds probably will not be able to comprehend it, but we do know for a surety. All that has been accomplished on the cross 
is because God wants us to enter into the heavenly sanctuary where He is. That's what it is all about. That's why the earth, the earthly copy of it will be obsolete. The book of Hebrews says, the, once Christ died and rose again, the earthly tabernacle or temple is obsolete. Everything that they do is obsolete. Because the true tabernacle now, with the true high priest, is there. Church, the high priest that we have is such a powerful high priest because I'm going to touch on one particular aspect this morning. And that particular, because it's so rich, what Christ has done for us. It's called the blood of sprinkling. It's called the blood of sprinkling. The high priest, every year, and God commanded Moses and said this, Aaron, every year, during especially uh, what you call uh, the Day of Atonement, eh? he will go into the holy place. The tabernacle temple has got three places. Outer court, holy place, only the priesthood can enter. Holy of holies, only the high priest once a year during the atonement. He has to do this. This is found in Exodus uh, 24 as well. Eh? He, was, he will have to do this. Take a bowl of the blood of the lamb that has been sacrificed. He will go in front of the veil. The veil that is separating the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is and the people of God or the presence of God and the people of God. And he will sprinkle seven times on the veil, on the curtain. Seven times you have to sprinkle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? With his fingers. All right? Then he will walk backwards, go to the altar of incense, which is standing in front of the veil. And the altar of incense got four corners. The Bible called them the four horns. It's the strength of the altar of incense. Then he will sprinkle the blood on all the four sides of the altar and right below it. Then he will walk outside and where the people are gathered, he will take the hishab. Hishab, what do you call uh, the hishab? What do you call? Uh, uh, it's kind of a bundle of probably herbs or what, I'm not sure. Huh? They will take that and then they will just sprinkle it on all the people. And every item in the tabernacle will be sprinkled to say that the covenant is now ratified. Covenant is now confirmed. Our covenant with God is confirmed. This morning when we partake of the blood of the Lord, which is a symbol of our new covenant with God, He said, drink it. He said, drink it. There is a reason why the Lord said, drink it. Because the context is Passover, celebration like we saw during Good Friday. This time, the high priest will sprinkle it. And when he sprinkles it, just imagine this church. He went to heaven with his own blood. He goes right in front of the most holy place where the throne of the Father is. Sprinkle seven times his blood. And then go to the altar of incense where the our prayers are like incense before the Lord. And he sprinkled there. And then he goes out, meets up with all of us, and he sprinkles us. Where does he sprinkle us? Where does it sprinkle us? The blood of sprinkling, what is it? Maybe some people say, you're so gory, eh? all blood being sprinkled everywhere. Do you know, what the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Hebrews 9 and 10 explains it in detail. There is no remission of sin at all. And for our sin, no human blood can atone for it. It has to be the blood of God that atones for our sin. And so what happened was, when He sprinkles... Now let me ask you a question. If you sprinkle the tabernacle on earth, I can understand because it's defiled. Why do you need to sprinkle heaven? Nothing defiled is inside there. Why do you need to sprinkle there? It's for you and I, church. It's to open the way. The Hebrew writer says... Through His flesh, you open up a new way for us to enter into it. Because we are going to enter, He sprinkled the blood and it opened. Can you imagine? The moment He sprinkled, just all these pictures uh, and scenes of the veil being torn from top to bottom so that we can enter into the presence of God. 
we have access into His presence. That's what the blood of the sprinkling does. And then, have you ever wondered why He sprinkled the altar of incense in heaven, where our prayers and our worship and all that goes to God? Symbolically, why? Church, think of this. Henceforth, our prayers are made effective before God. Our intercession is made effective before God. The scene in the book of Revelation is this. After the lamb who was slain is introduced, then you see bowls of incense the angels brought and poured it on the altar of incense. What does that mean? And the Bible says these bowls of incense are the prayers of the saints that God in His plans and purposes will consider the prayers of His people. We are partners together with Him. That's what it means. We are partners together with Him. That's why we are called the royal priesthood. We are part of the order of Melchizedek. We belong to the royal priesthood. To Him who loved us, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, to Him who loved us and washed us from our sins with His own blood and made us kings and priests unto God His Father, be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Even up to chapter 5, it says that. He made us kings and priests unto God our Father. Everybody look around each other and say, you are a royal priest. Let's remind ourselves, you are a royal priest. Say, I have a right to enter into the temple of heaven. Say, I have a right to... Because Christ has made me fit to enter into the temple of heaven. And church, this is something that we need to understand because if ever the devil is going to work overtime, is on this. The lesser you enter, the lesser you function as a royal priest, the better for him. The lesser you function as a royal priest, you and I, the better for him. Because he knows when we pray, when we intercede, when we stand in the gap, when we go before the altar of incense, God considers our prayer because of all that the Son has done through His life, death, and resurrection. Your prayers are effective, church. Your prayers are effective. Your prayers are not playful thing. Your prayers are really effective. In fact, the Bible says it goes up before God like incense into His nostril. Have you smelled incense? I'm not talking about our incense. Nah. I'm talking about the biblical incense is totally different. It gives you a sweet aroma, a calming effect. Huh? God, when you put that incense before Him, your prayer goes before Him. He is so pleased. He is so pleased with our prayers. And that's what it is. So, you know, when we go back to heaven, which is called... Mount Zion, the city of the living God. Mount Zion means the city of David. Na? Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. This is, what the, this is what the writer to the Hebrews is saying. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, not a dead God. We don't serve a dead God. The heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem. To an innumerable company of angels, Cannot count the number of angels. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, we are all members of this. We are all part of the general assembly and church of the firstborn registered in heaven. Say to one another, I'm registered in heaven. You are all, every one of us are registered in heaven. That's what the Bible says, sir. Now listen, to God the judge of all, we are going to see God who is the judge of all, but for us He's the rewarder of all. To the spirits of just men made perfect, all the saints are there. All our relation and loved ones are there. They have been made perfect by the blood of the Lamb. And then we are going to meet to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, the one who made it possible for all of us. And then He said, to the blood of sprinkling that speak better things of Abel. Why is the blood of sprinkling we will encounter in heaven? Because this is the blood 
that paid the penalty for our sins, that made us sons and daughters, that assures us eternal life. And this is the blood of sprinkling that speaks better of the blood of Abel. Why? When Cain, his brother, killed Abel, his blood cried out from the ground according to God. What the blood says? Vengeance, 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 revenge, because my brother has killed me. But the blood of Jesus, when he poured out, what did he say? Mercy, mercy, mercy. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Mercy, mercy, mercy. That's what the blood of sprinkling does. That's why it is the blood that speaks. Everybody say, the blood of sprinkling speaks. Church has got a mouth. It's got a mouth. It speaks. Not I say, what the Bible says. It speaks better things, church, for you and I. It speaks better things for you and I, church. It does not condemn us. It does not. The blood of Jesus, it speaks to each and every one of us. It's got a voice. And it's the voice of the Son of God. It is not like the blood of Abel. So where is this blood sprinkled? This blood is sprinkled in our hearts. This is how it is done in the Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, Peter said, you are all pilgrims. He was talking about all the Christians spread out in the northern part or southern eastern part of Europe. He said, you are elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, Again, the Trinity, eh? the sanctification of the Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit already set you apart for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, it is said, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts, what? Sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The blood is sprinkled into our hearts, into our spirit man church. That's what Christ did on the cross. What he did in heaven, he's still doing here on earth, sprinkling the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. And to get rid of this guilty conscience. You know, guilt is killing. Guilt comes and visits us every now and then. Our conscience will either accuse us or excuse us. It will either accuse us or excuse us. But when the conscience go into a guilt trip mode, you cannot handle it. Huh? It's, it's very difficult to understand when the conscience goes into a guilt trip mode. There's only one answer to it. The sprinkled blood of Jesus into our hearts. It takes away the guilt because the penalty has been paid. How many of us are struggling with guilt? How many of us, after walking for so many years with the Lord, are struggling with guilt? I do sometimes. Because guilt is so deep-seated, it at the level, only the blood reaches it. And let me tell you something. Every time your conscience speaks, the sprinkling blood as a voice, it also speaks. It also speaks. When your conscience condemns you, what does the blood speak to the conscience? It has been forgiven. But whose voice would you want to hear? The voice of your own old man who has been crucified with Christ or the voice of the blood that speaks cleansing and forgiveness, that speaks deliverance and freedom, and that speaks of the full liberty of God in Christ. You know, Spurgeon, I like Spurgeon eh? because when he touched on this subject, he said this, do you not hear it? If you take away the blood of sprinkling from the gospel, you have silenced it. Why? It has no voice if this be gone, he said. If you take the blood of sprinkling out of the gospel, the gospel has lost its voice. Oh, they say, the gospel has lost its power. What wonder when they have made it a dumb gospel. It's a dumb gospel because we cannot hear the voice of the sprinkling blood of Christ. And then he said this, how can it have power when they take away that which is its life and speech unless 
the preacher is ever more preaching this blood and sprinkling it by the doctrine of faith, his teaching has no voice. My teaching has got no voice if it is not founded upon the voice of the blood of Christ. It is founded on that church. It is the foundation of all things. In heaven, that is the only thing that speaks in the presence of God. Here on earth, it's the same. It speaks to us. But whose voice do we choose to hear? The voice of Christ who has accomplished everything that needs to accomplish for us on the cross or the voice of our own old men, our own voice. So think of this. It was sprinkled in the Holy of Holies, in the altar of incense, the congregation. This morning when we partook of the blood of the Lamb, what is it all about? We drink it. <laughs> There is a reason eh? when it's sprinkled and when you drink it, it's a two different thing. When you drink it, what did the Lord say? Remember me. What did He say? Drink of the new covenant. The context is the Passover celebration. That you are all part of me and I am in you. We are part in this covenant with God. We are part in this covenant with God. Let me close church. And this is the application. Application is taken from Hebrews, sorry, not 11, eh? Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25, not 11. Eh? Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. This is the application. All that Christ has done and His sprinkling blood has done for us. One, therefore, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 says, Therefore, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is His flesh. Therefore, have boldness. You know what boldness is in the Scripture? Boldness means freedom to speak. Freedom to speak. Freedom to speak in the context of the Scripture is prayer. Our communion with God. We have freedom to talk to God. We have that freedom that Adam lost in the Garden of Eden back. We can talk to Him. We can converse with Him in the holiest. And this boldness comes from the blood of Jesus. Second, having a high priest in the house of God. Who is the high priest? Christ Jesus our Lord. Because we have a high priest, now we can draw near with a true heart. Why? Because he was tempted in chapter 4 of Hebrews. He was tempted in every way and yet without sin. And he understands us. He understands our weaknesses. And because this high priest is there, we need not be afraid. Neither should we backtrack because of our weaknesses, our failures, our mistakes. We should enter because we have this great high priest there. And we need to draw near with a heart of faith. Because our hearts are already sprinkled from an evil conscience. So church, draw near. Draw near. Boldness and draw near. Third, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Because when we stand before the presence of God, we know He is faithful. Christ is known as the faithful and merciful high priest. Faithful and merciful high priest, Hebrews 2. And because He is faithful and merciful, we know that we can hold fast our confession of faith. What is our confession of faith? All that we stand for and all that we say and we claim as Christians. Our forgiveness, our eternal life in Christ, our new creation in Christ, all the promises that we claim it stands before the presence of God. And the writer to Hebrews telling the believers, hold on to it, don't let go. Because God is faithful. Our high priest is faithful. Then comes the practical part. This is very important. Eh? This is on earth. Up to this point is in heaven. Okay? Holding fast is between heaven and earth. Now comes to earth. So we had to come down to earth for a while. Okay? Earth is this. Let us consider one another. Let us think about one another. Let us think about one another. The Bible commands us to think about one another. It 
commands us, no? it, does, it tells us, let us think, consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Amen. How we can stir up love and good works among each other. And this is important, church, because all that is happening in heaven and on earth, this is what the writer of the Hebrews is saying. We need to consider, we need to think about one another, how we can provoke or stir up good works and love, which is so important, church. So, so important. And not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. This is, this is, <laughs> this is pivotal. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Either every Sunday, your small groups, wherever you meet, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You know, you don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. The world works on an overdrive mode. Overdrive mode to keep us all from assembling together. The devil will be very happy. Why? Because when we assemble here, what did the Lord say? When two or three are gathered together here on earth, and if you ask anything in my name, what will the Father do in heaven? It shall be done. It shall be done, church. As it is in heaven, so here on earth. So do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. To all my beloveds who are following online, please come to the church if you can. <laughs> please come. To the church if you can. Come and fellowship. Come. We need this because God's word commands it. All right, come. Wherever you are, come. Do not. You are not second class citizen of that. No, huh? You are here. You are the royal priest. You are part of the royal priesthood of Christ. And church, this is important. Exhorting one another all the more as you see the day of Christ coming. Church, we need to exhort one another. As long as it's called today, exalt one another because sin is also working on an overdrive mode. The world, it's a place where, I always tell people, there are enough discouragement in the world, why add to it? Everyone has got enough discouragement, why we add to it? The Bible says, exhort, encourage, admonish, do all those necessary to build up people, not to tear them down. The world has got all the formulas for us to tear, them, tear people down. Only the Bible has the answer. How to build people up. And church, we need to build people up. You see, oh, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, and hide in your room. The Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, and I'm praying and interceding in the room. No, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, go out to the world. The Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, exhort one another. The Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, go and do good works. The Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, go and preach the gospel. Live the life of a witness. That's how it is, the pattern in the Bible. And church, this is so important. And it's not from me, it's from the Word of God. And so whatever is happening in heaven has to happen on earth. And the practical part is this. We as a congregation, as the people of God, in partnership with Him in heaven. That's why Mark 16, 20 says it very clearly. And they went out to preach the gospel, and the Lord who is seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father, working together with them. What does He do? Confirming the word with signs following. Whatever His people are proclaiming, He confirms it by His Spirit. Amen? And church, I pray this morning, you will know that you are a royal priest. You have an access into the temple of heaven. You know, I still remember, and I told you this story before, the look on this taxi man's driver in Bali. He brought me from one temple to the other. They call it Pura. Pura is actually a Sanskrit word. It means temple. He said, Pura. So he told me, Bapa, they call it Father, right? I said, Bapa, you can, I will bring you to all this Pura in Bali. I said, bring me, bring me. So he brought me to all the Pura. Then he came to one Pura, one temple. He said, uh, I cannot enter here. I cannot enter here. I asked him why. He said, because I'm of the low caste. Because they, they follow Hinduism, I'm locust. If I enter here, I defiled it. If I enter this temple, I defile it. You can go, Baba. He said, no. I said, no, I don't want to go. I just want to see from far. Then I turned around and I told him, I want to tell you about a better temple. Are you ready? He said, which Pura? I told him Pura. I said, you want to know about better Pura? No? He said, what Pura? This Pura is the Pura of all Puras. I told him, it is found in heaven. This Pura is in heaven. 
He looked at me, what are you talking about? Then I shared the gospel to him. I said, listen carefully. There is the long story short. Huh? I told him this. I said, this Lord Jesus Christ, who is the high priest, they can understand very well. Huh? This Lord Jesus Christ, the high priest in heaven, has shed his blood and has made you and I fit to enter into this pura of heaven. You can enter into the very predo. Forget about all these puras here, I said. No. He has made you fit. Yes, you are a sinner. I was a sinner. But his blood has made us righteous and went even further, made us priests unto our God. He looked at me. He said, how shall I enter this pura? He said, hold on, I said. I'm not going to pray with you now. I want you to enter the pura. You go back home tonight. You be on your knees and you say, this God of the heavenly temple, whose name is the Lord Jesus Christ in Vasa. I say, you call on him and tell me if he doesn't answer you. He said, I will do, Papa. I will do, Papa. I will go back and I will pray and I will call upon his name. Church, we need to invite people to come to the temple of heaven like this. Forget about this temple on earth, you know, and all kind of things happening here. Huh? Forget about all that. We need to invite people and say, you are fit by the blood of Christ to enter into the temple of heaven. Every one of us, every sinner cleansed by the blood of the Lamb can come into the temple of heaven. Every one of them have been made fit by the great high priest. And church, we need to remind ourselves there are a lot of people out there who need to come into this temple of heaven to see the great high priest for them. You and I cannot be enjoying our great high priest alone. It's for every one of them out there who are crying out. And they need to know there's a great high priest who loves them, who gave his life for them. Amen? Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We bless you, Lord. We thank you. Father, we thank you for your word unto us, O Lord. We thank you, Lord. Your word is so, so, so real, O God. Lord, this morning we pray the temple of heaven is open, Lord. The doors are not closed. So we pray, Lord. Daily as we come into your presence to have that understanding and that assurance in our hearts, O God, that we are in your presence. Father, you hear our prayers. And Father, we thank you that because of all your Son has done for us, Lord, by your sweet Holy Spirit, you are accomplishing in us day in, day out that as we behold your glory, we will be transformed to be more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ from glory to glory by your Spirit, Lord. We thank you. And Lord, help us while we understand and you know about what is happening in heaven here on earth, O oh Lord. Help us to think about one another, our own brothers and sisters, those who do not know you yet, Lord. How to stir up love and good works, O God. Assembling ourselves, knowing that you are in our midst, that whatever we do here, it will be done in heaven, Lord, because you have ordained and mandated it, Lord. And Lord, we thank you. Help us to exhort one another, Lord. Grant us by your Spirit, who is the Spirit of counsel and might, to exhort one another, to encourage and build up one another, not to tear down, Lord. And where people are torn down, Lord, help us to build up again, Lord. For you have given us the grace to do so, Lord. And the breach that has been broken, help us to bridge it again, O God. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you. Here on earth as it is in heaven, your name be hallowed. Your kingdom come and your will be done here in Gateway Christian Fellowship, Lord. In Jesus, our Lord, most precious name.